Ladies and gentlemen, hello and a very warm welcome to you all for being here at our scale Startups and Scale-Ups for SDGs pitching event. My name's Elaine Franz and I'll be your host for this afternoon. We're featuring today so many of our forward-thinking young entrepreneurs from around the world. And it's a real celebration of all the hard work that they've done in their entrepreneur's journey, and particularly through this week, and they're going to showcase for you today. So first, I'd like to welcome the Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD, Isabel Durand, to open our ceremony. So, first of all, welcome in this Nai Hall. Uh, it's different as the room 10, where you spend a lot of time from the beginning of the week. In this room, uh, two weeks ago, I think, uh, a red carpet was here, and we welcomed a lot of members uh, of the uh, head of state, uh, Minister of Trade, of Development for the World Investment Forum. So you are in the same room. Maybe you are not head of state, but maybe you will become head of state. Why not? Uh, with your project. So, welcome to you, welcome to all the friends and uh, uh, the jury, of course, because they have a big role this afternoon. So, um, you will, uh, in a few minutes, present your pitch, and I speak to the, the candidates. Um, even though I'm used to making speech regularly, I will try also to make my, my pitch, not my speech, but my pitch. Hmm? But, nevertheless, before the pitch, let me start with a few things that uh, you would have to know uh, be before uh, starting. First of all, that this Global Entrepreneurship Week is, of course, a wonderful tool to mobilize not only you, but a million people uh, from more than 100 countries in the six continents every year in November. So you are a, a, a small part of a big group uh, mobilized uh, regarding this Entrepreneurship Week. Secondly, you have to know that UNCTAD, the organization uh, that has the responsibility, uh, UNCTAD is United Nations Conference for Trade and Development. Because UNCTAD, what means UNCTAD? Well, it's, so we are dedicated to trade and development, or more precisely, trade for development. How trade could help the countries to develop their own capacities uh, uh, globally. So, uh, UNCTAD is proud to have been at the roots of this initiative in Geneva, and particularly with projects related to entrepreneurship for women and refugees and migrants, which is for us very important to help you and to give you the possibility to those people to do uh, uh, useful things for their country or their welcome country, peu importe where they are. So, thirdly, that this event is organized in collaboration with key partners. And first of all, I will citate WIPO. WIPO is an organization of the United Nations system, very important regarding intellectual property, which is key in the development of digitalization and all this uh, uh, industrial revolution that we, we, that we are knowing now. So thank you, WIPO, to be uh, uh, with us today. And also a Poly Politecnico of Milano, uh, which are all also a partner. You have also to know that this year, two new partners have joined us, and it's OIM, uh, Organization International for Migration, and Capacity, a Swiss incubator that operates with and for entrepreneurs with a migrant or refugee origin or background. So uh, to all those partners, thank you to be together today in order to celebrate your pitch. So now I come to the pitch. You are born in the 21st century. You are the generation which can change your countries, their economy, and their development strategy. Before this week, maybe your perception of UN was probably unclear. A lot of people discussing, making speeches, negotiating resolution, uh, and so on, uh, all the time with uh, nice clothes, uh, big cars, and badges. Okay, that's the people of the UN. But it's not completely wrong. Uh, and that's what we did before, before 2015, when we finally adopted 17 SDGs, so Sustainable Development Goals, 
summarizing not only our dream for the world of tomorrow, but the common goal of 192 countries member of the UN. That's not nothing, so that all the countries together could make an agreement on what they would like to have uh, in the next decade. So it was really important to do that after long, long, long negotiation. Well, therefore, we have now to implement them. And that's not the easy part of the, of the, the thing. So we need to do that. We need you. We need your energy. We need your creativity. And I can see from the short description of your project that you have captured the essence of the SDGs, incorporating climate, environment, social and economic dimension in your business. And because business, for me, for us, for UMTAD, business for business is not the message of the SDGs. Meaningful and fair businesses, which are close to people and close to the planet, and which give them uh, what they need on short and long term. That's the business that we need, that's the business that you will try to start. And that's why uh, uh, I'm so proud of you, and that's what you have done so far, that's what you will do after this week in Geneva, and I hope that this week will help you to develop your own project, and I would like to congratulate you, and I hope that also you will be able to convince and to inspire other people, other young people, rural, women, men, refugees or not, peu importe, other people to dare to innovate and create uh, a meaningful and fair business because it's on you that SDG will be implemented or not. So, thank you for that. Yes, you can. And so I look to the jury. How was my pitch? <laughs> okay, good. <Oof>. <laughs> voilà. <laughs> Thank you so much, Isabel. Uh, on behalf of all of us here at UNCTAD, um, Fiorina Muccioni, Fulvia Farinelli, Philippe Huda, Amira Nabani, and myself, we'd like to also thank the co-organizers of the event, IOM, WIPO, Politecnico di Milano, Capacity Zurich, Flow in Action, and of course, the award sponsor, One Creation. From WIPO, we have Marisol Iglesias. Marisol? Would you stand and just say a few words of welcome? Good afternoon. In fact, we are three colleagues here from WIPO 4. Um, uh, probably I have the less degree, <laughs> but uh, I have been cooperating with Fulvia, and Fiorina, and UNTAC team uh, for this activity. And our message is that the SDGs is also about partnering. And partnering means this is, an, this is an example, it's public-private partnership, because we have partners uh, that come from the private sector, and innovation and creativity is at the heart of new business that can create employment for young people, and employment that can contribute to the SDGs too, to the different sustainable development goals. So not only uh, making IP to work for you, intellectual property or innovation or creativity, but to serve other people and to have a win-win situation. Thank you. Thank you, Marisol. And from IOM, we have Marina Monke. Please, Marina, would you say a few words of welcome? Thank you very much. So it's very uh, challenging now to come with another pitch before the next pitches, but let me try very quickly. I'm really happy to be here, a part of this uh, uh, team uh, which is celebrating today a youth, celebrating development, and I'm so happy to also see migration becoming also uh, a word which is uh, lining up in these beautiful positive messages and, and uh, of course, uh, I guess if we start uh, going through the audience, most of you probably have some sort of migration background. So it's, it's becoming the mobility, human mobility as we move forward, it becomes such a part of our life that it becomes challenging for us to now understand how come every time we hear the word about migration is, is something not so positive evolving in the minds of lots of people. But let's not focus about the negative, let's really celebrate uh, the positive uh, aspects uh, and we're really committed towards continuing this new partnership, the word was mentioned already. Um, we're looking forward to the very important 
an event in, which is taking place in a few weeks in Marrakesh. We really hope that the new uh, era, era of collaboration on migration, around migration among governments, but also civil society and the private sector is coming with the adoption of the compact. It's very another UN word, which probably is not so exciting, but what it means in reality is that we want to continue these types of uh, initiatives together, and we're looking forward to today's uh, celebration, and good luck with those who are competing. We are with you. And from Capacity Zero, we have Valentina Valandia. Hi, my name is Valentina Valandia, and I'm here with my colleague Ana Maria, and we are here to represent our beautiful community of um, migrant and refugee entrepreneurs. We have a startup incubator in Zurich and we plan to expand because we truly believe in the democratization of entrepreneurship. Um, so we wish each and every one of you the best and best of luck. Enjoy the moment. Um, I know it's nerve wracking, but we're all here for you and with you. Thank you. And finally, before welcoming on stage our first entrepreneur, I'd like to introduce you to our panel of experts from the field of impact investment, sustainable development, and innovation, who've been evaluating the pitches, the business models to date, and evaluate the pitches today. So, Ms. Claire Bess, who's a jury member of Business Angels Switzerland. Ms. Brinduza Burrows, the founder of the Ground Up Project. Monsieur Bertrand Gacon, founder of Impact and head of Impact Investing at Lombard ODA. Monsieur Mathias Kuhn, Licensing Officer at Unitech, University of Geneva. Ms. Audrey Selian, Director of Arta Initiative and Rianta Capital. And of course, President of the panel and award sponsor, Monsieur Olivier Ferrari, Founder and Executive Director of One Creation. Can we have a round of applause because they've worked very hard also. So we received over 200 entries for this year's event in the two categories of startup and scale-up enterprises. Our finalists were selected and shortlisted on the basis of three aspects, sustainability of their business, the business model, and the impact in their communities that they wanted to serve. We'll hear first from our startup entrepreneurs. Each candidate will give a five-minute presentation about their business following which we'll invite uh, one question from the audience. So please make a note and we'll, we'll make sure that we do that. We'll then hear briefly from uh, Olivier and we'll watch a short video from last year's winner, Jennifer Shigoli, the founder of Elia Pads. And then we'll move on to our scale-up entrepreneurs and hear their pitches and also invite a question after each pitch for the entrepreneur. We then get our expert panel members to go and deliberate, and at which point we're going to get you as the audience members to do some voting, so have your smartphones ready. We're going to ask you some questions about your interpretations of the SDGs and your appetite for entrepreneurship. As they deliberate, the expert panel will be choosing to award to one startup entrepreneur a grant of $5,000 sponsored by One Creation, and an award for the scale-up entrepreneur of equity financing of 15,000 US dollars. So this event during Global Entrepreneurship Week in Geneva is of great significance to all of us and building the collaboration and partnerships across Geneva and globally. We wish everybody the best of luck. So moving on to our startups. I would like to invite Fatou Mane, who is the founder of Jelma Habella. Yeah. Fatou is a migrant entrepreneur from the Gambia, and she produces organic teas, beverages, and baby food. Would you believe when I tell you that 70% of the population in the Gambia lives below the poverty line. And in that 70%, 60% are women, and I mean rural women farmers, who work day in, day out to make a living out of their farm produce. Now, this is my business. Now, you can see this is a woman who wake up as early as 6 a.m. to go to her farm, harvest her farm produce, and go to the market to sell them, to make a living. And you will be surprised 
how many hours, hours does he, he spend in the market just to make not less than two dollars? He spent six hours, six hours to make not less than two dollars. And that's the same two dollars he's gonna make, she's gonna use to take care of herself and the family. Now you ask yourself, how long will it take this woman and her family to move out of the poverty line? It's a question to be answered. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Fatou Mane from the Gambia. Hold a bachelor's degree in development studies. Currently doing my master's program on entrepreneurship, University of Milano, Bicocca, Italy. I own a startup enterprise called Jail Mahabela. And what our enterprise aims to do is to work with women farmers, local women farmers, to buy their harvest, process them into dry tea leaves, package them in our tea products, and also sell it to the local consumers. So this is a problem because we have value-added problem. 5% value-added um, contribute only 5% to our GDP. 5%. Women work in the farm, produce their harvest, and go and sell it in a farm raw. That is with no value addition. And also make much of sales out of it. So what we intend to do is to work with women farmers to do what? To create a value-added product that is organically grown and harvested in the Gambia. At the same time, work with women farmers in the supply chain. So this is a win-win situation from the enterprise and also the women farmers that we're going to work with. So now with this product that I'm going to buy from the farmer, that is the fresh tea leaves, we're going to produce them in different varieties of tea. And this is the reason why we want to give a preference to our customers to have a choice, not to impose one product on them. So do we have a variety of tea products that are organically produced and organically harvested, processed and dried and packaged beautifully. So this is our, these are varieties of products that I use. And it's a scalable business because when you look at it, Gambia is ranked number 16 when it comes to tea consumption. And 85% of our population consume tea every day. And none of those tea is, consuming the, in, is produced in the Gambia. All are imported tea. So there's a huge potential and a market for my product in the Gambia. So now, of course, in every business that you see, it must attempt to respond to a need. And in that need, you contribute to the social and environmental problem of that community or the country. Now you look at it. You have women and youth working in the farm. It's a work for them. It's a job. And second, because we produce organically, it's eco-friendly and it's healthy for every individual going to consume the product, especially the tea. Now, this is what we do. It's we create access to the market for women farmers, create jobs for young people, youth and women, increase availability of quality organic added value Gambian products so that it can also contribute to our GDP. As I said, 5%. That's what it contributes, which is very bad. Now you look at it also, we can also what, serve as a market for herb growers in the Gambia and also hire women in the value chain. So it's, you buy, we buy your products, we give you earning, at the same time also employ you in the factory to be able to work and also have a living. Now with that, we contribute to two major SDGs. That is one, number one, zero poverty. If a woman should spend five, six hours in the market just to make two dollars, and now you have somebody who's going to give you an earning within five five dollars within thirty minutes. That's an added advantage for you. So this is something that we do. And if you do that, you're giving a smile to a woman. And if you give a smile to a woman, you're improving her life and the life of the family that she's going to work with. So this is my current market: tea lovers and people who want to live naturally healthy. We're going to have an outlet, and the future plan is organic baby food. Why? Because we are, we also have a high rate of malnutrition, which is at it peak. And also we want to have garlic and black pepper production because we don't have all those things in the Gambia. All is being imported from outside the Gambia. So with this, our revenue model is we're going to be with two people, B2B and B2C partners. B2B based on what? Collaboration and understanding of how long they're going to give us the money back. B2C is individual buyer. They're going to come to the outlet and buy the farm produce. And we're going to use the social media, all forms, to be able to sell our products. The final slide talks about what? Yes, this is our competitive advantage. Purely organic, healthy, and delicious. And compared to our competitors, inconsistency is longer than dissolved. Longer than it, it, it takes longer to dissolve than it needed. And also, it's chemically grown tea. So we produce organically. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Fatu. So now I'd like to invite a, a question from the audience. Or the panel members. Claire? Thank you. Uh, congratulations, it was a great speech. Uh, just a little question. What are you going to do with the money if you win the prize? Um, currently, I have spent $2,500 in product branding, product labeling. I also have built um, a in local drying facility built by me. So if I win the prize, I'm going to buy a processing machine that is costing $6,000. So if that have that $5,000, I can work to earn $1,000 to add it to buy a processing machine that can help me boost my production capacity and also be able to serve the required market that I have in the Gambia. Thank you. Thank you, Fatu. And now I'd like to invite Astrid Ajinoko. Astrid is the founder of Vegetables of Hope from Benin, currently living in Algeria as a migrant entrepreneur. Vegetables of Hope grows affordable, local, organic vegetables for domestic consumption, and she's also prototyping a natural fertilizer. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Astrid, and I'm from Benin. I have a master's degree in water engineering. Let me ask you a question. Does it happen to you? You wake up in the morning wondering, how am I going to eat today? How can I feed my son and my daughter? This is not a myth, actually, it's reality. And this is what is really happening in the rural areas of my country. And that is the reason why I decided to start Vegetables of Hope. Beyond giving hope to the population of my country, I want to give them food. I want to give them affordable and high nutrient content food. Vegetables of Hope is a, a company that produces and sells, it is a startup, we produce and sell great tasting organic potatoes at affordable prices. And yes, our business is pretty much scalable because we will be the very first local company in the country that produce affordable potatoes for the population. So look at this huge market potentiality that we have. And also two years from now, we will be integrating three other vegetables in our food production system. And also we are going to create sale points. Five years from now, we are planning to create 10 different small size sail points throughout the rural areas of the country to give jobs to the women in our country. And by doing this, we are contributing to zero hunger and also climate action because we use sustainable to climate smart agricultural tool to produce our potatoes. And you know what? I am a returning migrant and Vegetable of Hope is planning to give jobs to 10 returning migrants and also young, uh, local young people from the local community, of which 50% are women. By giving job, we are attaining no poverty. And you know why people are not poor and they are eating uh, our high quality potatoes? They are in good health. And when we have good health people, they do what they contribute to their communities, SDGs number 11. And what is our market? It's B2B and B2C. We sell to restaurants, we are planning to sell to restaurants and hotels and also directly to customers. And we reach them through sale contracts and also we reach customers directly via uh, our application. We are developing an application that we'll call Pick, Pack and Eat. So you just go through your mobile app and you just pick how many kilograms you want and we pack nicely and we deliver it to your door. And we make ourselves known through the use of social media. We are on Instagram, we are on Facebook, and we are on Twitter. And also we do radio advertising and poster um, in um, the cities. And what is our revenue model? It's simple. We produce potatoes and we sell potatoes at these prices, and you will see why. Uh, one of our major competitors in Benin is Faso potato. Potatoes coming from Burkina Faso, which is a very much expensive. 
how do you want people in my country to buy potatoes at one kilogram of potatoes at more than one dollars, 1.5 dollars, and a lot of them are living under the poverty line. How do you want them to buy one kilogram of potatoes at 1.5 dollars? It's impossible. That is the reason why we very much decrease the price so that everyone can have access to high nutrient content food. So affordability and availability is one of our two main strengths. So what we have achieved so far, I invested $2,000 from my own saving in my farm. Uh, I tried to buy, I bought 0.5 hectares of land and some small, very small equipment, traditional equipment. And we launched um, pilot testing uh, of potatoes on 1,000 meter squares. And we are expecting production, uh, harvest um, end of February, beginning of March. So what do we need? With uh, the $5,000 that we will uh, gain, we will be able to make our water bohol because we don't have water in the farm. We will be able to make the water bohol and we will be able to buy one seedling and harvester machine, small one. And we will also be able to make our irrigation kits for the 0 0.5 hectares. And also we will train our workers because it is very much important to train people that is going to work on the farm. So this money will serve to do that. So ladies and gentlemen, I want you to do something for me. Uh, this is a potato, pick, pick one one. It is a sweet potato, it's not yet my potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you will pick one. And when you we start just you one 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 and go to your home, when you start seeing some uh, white and uh, purple green thing. I want you to buy small buckets that you put on your balcony. I want you to see these potatoes and grow it. When you will succeed to harvest these potatoes, remember Benin, my country, where there is food insecurity, where people don't have food to eat. And remember me. Who wants to make this happen? Thank you, Astrid, that was uh, fantastic. Um, I'd like to invite a question from the audience or the panel, please. So as you said, you're the first one who actually produces potatoes uh, in Benin. So my question is if it's that possible that you can start with 2,000 US dollars, why is not anyone doing it? And what if you actually succeed, maybe with the first harvest in March, and someone else is entering the market? How are we going to deal with the competition? Thank you very much. Uh, you know, in my country, when you finish studying, it's very hard for you to find a job. But I try to work. I work before being an entrepreneur. I work, and I save a lot of money. That is the reason why I try to make this. And it's not that I just put automatically $2,000. No. When I found something, I bought a lot. I found something, I bought small material. I found something, I save it for, so, for other things to buy. That is the reason why it all makes $2,000 and I have started. Why people cannot start potatoes production? You know, potatoes is very water consuming crop. And in my country, it's very much expensive for you to do a boat to get water. How do you want people in the village or someone to do this? In addition to that, land is also very much expensive. So you just don't go like this and say, I want to grow potatoes. Is something that you prepare, you prepare, you prepare. And I was preparing this since three years ago. So yeah. And because we, we are pioneers, I, I will try to run fast, but very much, so that I can cure a lot of market, so that if another one comes, I don't think that she will find a, a place to compete with me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Astrid. Now I'd like to invite Alberto Arredondo, who's the founder of Green Energy Technologies with the Shigara Water Tank. So, um, Alberto has worked incredibly hard all week. Um, he is a native Spanish speaker, and so he'll be reading his presentation, his pitch in English, 
which is a huge achievement, a huge step for him this week. He's from Colombia. He lives as a migrant entrepreneur in Nicaragua. And his device collects, stores, and purifies water so that people have access to clean drinking water. Alberto. Good morning. No, good afternoon. No? Afternoon. <laughs> OK. I am sorry, but I don't speak English. Uh, but I had a great idea. Uh, what will happen is one day we do not have a water. <clears throat> My name is Alberto Redondo from Nicaragua. I am entrepreneur and founder of the Green Energy a Startup. A for-profit is a model of to grow at a scale and financial self sustainability. Our main jobs, the next person, please. So our main job is the manufacture and distribution of the new technology for the access to healthy water. Our venture is started in 2000, experimenting a process of investigation, development, and innovation in our invention. Shagara Purification Water Tank is reconnaissance by MIT and Tecnológico de Monterrey. <coughs> Shagara. Is a, is a product three in one. It's a device a collect, purific, purify, and store. Has an effective, effective, effectiveness 99.9% due the unification of technology of so long, useful life, and able to turn wine into water. It has of capacity. 500 liter is a universal and modular product, and it can be comp complete with well and air wells and solar water pumps. We are currently launching on the market the test edition. is a tank with a portable filter, uh, 250 liters is an assemble system that store, collect, and filter water by gravity. Elimination, el eliminating color and bacteria. Please net the next. 80 million children drink water contaminated with fecal, fecal matter uh, 2,000 die every day to the lack of safe water, the sa safe the water and efficient san sanation. What are we doing to solve this? Chagara con contribute the objective of the susten sustainability development and improving the life of family. For an example, imagine the the water you drink has a vast state that same water can contain bacteria and virus which generate diseases such as cholera and diarrhea is a limited resource that you do not have every day because inequalities that exist in your society. And you only earn $2 a day and the small bottle of the water costs a dollar. That bottle does not generate responsible consumption. It ends up in your river and the lake. And its production is a production fits a climate change in a country effect be drug and high temperature. They make you think of a, sh of a shame. Chagara is a soul these other problems. Please. Okay. We, are need, we need to reach that why our business model is a B2B manufacturer and, distrib distrib and distrib distributor. Our distribution channel is a Channel a retail chain, a store, and a small business affiliate in each city, managed 
be in e-commerce platform, but attention to this distributor and financial cost customer. And many people, this product to improve the quality of the drinking water to the million home uh, represent the 70 percent. Um, Less than and, two seconds. Okay. A storage and infiltra infiltration of water with ergonomic system to solve emergency situation and community is represented 12 percent uh, to replace to purchase the bottled water with the water purification sheet in company to represent the 10 percent. Please the next. For 2099, we expect to manufacture a uh, thousand units for our tank with portable filter, which uh, will be sold uh, accessible price with a profit margin of uh, 25 percent to, to, gener to generate income for the construction of our Shagara factory and to obtain a 1.2 million for our master plan. Uh, we currently time. carry out at a crowdfunding campaign for the $55,000 in Indiegogo. Okay, that's the okay. end now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you stay there, sir. Stay. Stay there. We have the, uh, the, the, the benefit of being inside the UN, which is a multilingual community. I see a question from Nicola. Fulvio will um, translate. So. It's clear. On the first slide, um, there were solar panels on the farms. How will you purchase to get these solar panels? Okay. Los paneles solares eh, que acompañan el tanque purificador de agua eh, es un complemento para el, los sistemas de bombeo. En comunidades eh, en riesgo eh, se abastece de agua a través de sistemas de gasolina que necesitan tanto los sistemas de tratamiento como el sistema de bombeo. Nuestro sistema se complementa a través de sistemas de, de bombeo fotovoltaico. He says that the solar panels are a complement to the water tank, so the, that it's completely uh, uh, ecologically friendly because they don't need any electricity, but uh, it helps to operate the pumps. So it's, uh, it's complementary to the purifying water tank. Does, does this answer your question? Sorry, does this answer your question? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. And now I'd like to invite Antoine Rager. He is the founder. <laughs> he is the founder of Porsa Taste. He's from France, living in Italy, and produces edible vegan cutlery to reduce disposable single use plastic. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Antoine Rager. I'm French. I'm a student of the Politecnico di Milano in Master of Engineering Management. And today I'm here to introduce you Posa Taste. Posa Taste is a company offering edible cutlery as a sustainable, is an innovative alternative to plastic cutlery. And I want to start with the story of the idea. Last summer, I was using a little plastic spoon to eat a, an ice cream in Milan, and I told myself, well, I'm using it for five minutes, and then I have to throw it to the bin. What a shame. And actually, thousands of people are doing like me, so Every second, there are thousands of plastic cutlery thrown to the bin. And I told myself, but 
why couldn't I just eat the spoon? So I'm creating no waste. And I started thinking about edible cutlery. Edible cutlery is a kind of biscuit that is resistant enough to be used as a tool and that does not become soggy when it is in contact with liquid. So you can use with any soft food like ice cream, yogurt, marmalade, or to steer your hot drinks. Uh, and after disposal, you just have to eat it, so it's creating no, weight, no waste. Though so the main objective of this product is to reduce plastic waste. So that is contributing to two of the 17 goals of, of United Nations. First, making production and consumption more responsible. Edible cutlery is made only with natural ingredients and non-polluting methods. Second, you know that the marine litter is composed as 70% of single-use plastic. So we are reducing plastic waste and protecting life below water. Then, to reach this goal, of course, we need customers. How customers are any businesses or individuals currently using or looking for disposable cutlery solution. So companies, schools, organizations using plastic cutlery in the cafeteria are potential customers. And I want to give you just one figure to let you understand how big is this market. In, in Europe, plastic cutlery market is about $1 billion a year. So with the European decision to ban single-use plastic, including plastic cutlery, the company has the opportunity to take a, a big share of this cake. Now, I'm not the first one coming there offering an alternative to plastic cutlery. People have already invented wooden cutlery, biodegradable plastic cutlery, but they've tried to compete on the same performance attribute of the market than plastic cutlery. And actually, they're performing worse and they're still creating waste. Edible cutlery instead wants to differentiate, offering something that you can eat, customizable like cinnamon, chocolate, lemon, orange. So let's imagine the next time you have an ice cream, you can choose the taste of your biscuits with the taste of your ice cream. Or at your next coffee break, you can chew the, the biscuits that you can eat at the end. So that's a new paradigm that I want to develop. For now, I'm producing my product artisanally in my kitchen. But my objective in the short term is to be able to standardize recipes, increase production capacity, and then be able to serve customers. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we don't have any free ice creams to, to offer you. Uh, we have two questions from the floor, uh, Bertrand and then this gentleman. Thanks a lot, Antoine. Uh, just one question about the, uh, how long you can actually, uh, yeah, the conservation of those spoons, how long can you keep them uh, before they actually, uh, you have to throw them away? Yeah. Uh, so when you use it or when it's produced? Before you use them, okay. So the main factor of preemption for biscuit are humidity. And my biscuits are quite dry, so you can conserve it for long term. So for instance, I have a production that I made two, two months ago and I can still use it. So it's long term conservation. And the other question? This is it, okay. Oh, and... Uh, an Italian in the room who loves ice cream. Posso prendere le domande in italiano, però. Okay, we're not going to confuse the, 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 the audience, but uh, I love your idea. I'm a foodie myself and I love food. But what about uh, our diet for the ladies? We're going to put more weight on. So, do you have a solution? Yeah, so I can, if I can reassure you, biscuits. Uh, Spoons are about five grams, so I don't know how it is in terms of calories, but it's very small amount. So I'm offering you cutlery that I produce artisanally, so not that much sugar. And uh, so I don't think the impact of your diet will be huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Can I suggest any further questions? We, we pick up at the end when you have the opportunity to meet the candidates, but it's great to see you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And our final startup candidate is Dr. Adareni Abiodun, who is the founder of Help Mom from Nigeria. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, before my speech, and after I finish my speech, we will have lost two um, pregnant women in Nigeria due to a lack of access to basic health tools. Um, my name is Adirin, Dr. Adirin Yabiodun. I'm a doctor and also I have a certificate in, in entrepreneurship management from the Lagos Business School in Nigeria, and I run Help Mom. Currently in Nigeria, Nigeria is the second largest contributor to maternal ratio in the world. And um, the major two causes of maternal mortality is infection and also um, postpartum hemorrhage, which is heavy bleeding. And one of the causes of infection is sepsis, is lack of access to basic tools during delivery. Let me, let me tell you something. This is the smallest and the lowest thing you can get for delivery in Nigeria. It's just zero point something cent. In rural communities, traditional bath attendants, community health workers use rusty blades, broken glasses on women during deliveries. And they, sometimes when they don't have access to tools, they use the same tools to have delivery from different women which leads to aftermath of infection and maternal mortality. We lose 2,300 on the five children daily and one for the five pregnant women daily. So how do we solve this problem at Help Mom? We provide these women with Help Mom Clean Bath Kit. This kit contains 12 essential tools a mother needs during delivery. We provide traditional bath attendants with something called the emergency cart. This emergency cart can save misoprostol, this is what a, a traditional bath attendant can use on a mother actually experiencing heavy bleeding during pregnancy. And also, we have an vaccination tracker. We believe we can use low-cost innovation like this and the power of mobile technologies to tackle two things. One, low-cost innovation to tackle maternal mortality, why the power of mobile technology to tackle child mortality. You ask me why, how does this work? This contains the vaccination a child should have from zero to nine years. So when it's in this, um, our kit, when the mother delivers safely, clean, hygienic delivery, she can be able to take this vaccination tracker to her immunization officer so that when she clicks on the vaccination for her child and she leaves that country and she goes to another country, the vaccination officer giving her the next vaccination, we know the last vaccination her child has. So this is the problem we are solving in Nigeria and we are using low cost innovation and the power of mobile technology for it. Next slide. You ask me, what is the significant market size for, for this? In the next two years, the market size has been projected for, for $72 million. Currently in Nigeria, we have 9.2 million pregnant women yearly. Half of them stay in rural areas and refugee camps. So we have a huge market for what we do and we know how we're gonna go about it. And you ask me, I will tell you, we have competitors, and I've done a little competitive metrics so that we can understand. We have trademark for what we do. Our hours, we are the only one using a reusable bag. And this serves as a marketing strategy for us. So when a mother goes out, I, I just got help mom's pack, I had a safe delivery, okay. Our address is at the back. They can even call us directly to get the pack from us. And also, we also have, we also solve the problem of postpartum hemorrhage with the musoprostol drug in our emergency cart. So we find a synergy to use the power of mobile technology and low-cost innovation to tackle maternal and infant mortality in Nigeria. On next slide. So these are the women that have used our kits in Nigeria, so we are not just talking these are, and they were able to pay $5 conveniently. What am I going to use the $5,000 to do? Simple, we are going to use it to provide 1,250 pregnant women in rural areas with this bag, clean part kit, and they'll be able to have access to clean and safe delivery. And in the next four months, we'll be able to provide 5,000 pregnant women with the $5,000 at the end of the day. This is my team. I'm the CEO, this is the CTO. We are all young people, we call ourselves the young changers, trying to change the narrative of maternal and infant health in Nigeria. Thank you.
So we have a, a question from the floor. Please, could you explain to us how do you work with local public health authorities in order to distribute your, tool, to, your kit? Okay. Huh? Um, yeah, um, because of the short time we had, I couldn't explain deeper into that. What we do basically is that this pregnant women trust these community health workers better than us. So we find that insensitive to give to these community health workers and traditional bath attenders to sell our kit. Okay, if you sell 100 kit, you get a commission. So that gives them more energy to sell to women in their communities. And also, we use something also. Most of the people we sell our kids to are not first-time mothers. They are second-time mothers, third-time mothers. They will tell them that when I used Help Mom Kit for my second delivery, I was, there was no infection or anything. But I had complication with my first bath because I didn't have access to safe tools. And everybody loves to live. Everybody, nobody wants to die. So they tend to call us to give our kid out. Thank you, Adarini. So that concludes our um, pitches from our startup entrepreneurs. I'd like to invite Olivier Ferrari, our event award sponsor, to say a few words before we watch a video from last year's winner, Jennifer Shigoli. And then we have the movie. After we have the movie. We have the movie after. Yes. So, wow, great. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to see you until the end. Uh, I've seen the people before we spoke 20 minutes. That's great. That's very difficult for us to choose which project is, is the best one, is the good one, you know? So as I told you before, you're all the winners today, and then for the choose, it's another thing. Uh, just to introduce One Creation Cooperative. One Creation, like you, I have an ambition. This one is huge. Uh, I will create the biggest community for sustainable investment will have a positive impact on the environment. This community, I choose the cooperative concept. Everyone could be an associate. It costs a little bit, $10,000 to be associate. But to say, we will connect people around the world. They said, you are partner of a project. We will invest. We will be part of company who will impact positively the environment. Could be a startup, startup early stage, startup confirm, <coughs> non-listed company, listed company on infrastructure. This huge project, this is the disruption in finance. You won't find kind of proposal in the finance, and this is where we are looking for. And this is why we are supporting your project, because it's exactly where you are. And personally, I like, I love people who are creating their company. When you do that, this is very wonderful. In Europe, if you create a company and you don't realize a good project or you were losing at the end because it fall down, it's bad. In the United States, if you realize it one and you don't realize the good one first, you can create a second and a third one. This is the difference that we have. So you have done it, go away, do it, and never listen to the people around you. Do it what you think with your heart and do what you can as long as you can do it. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Shigoli from Tanzania. I'm the CEO and founder of Malkia Investments Company Limited. We manufacture and distribute a layer reusable sanitary pads. These are the types of pads that can be used and washed and reused and they last for a period of one year. Our goal in production of these um, sanitary pads is simple is to help the girls break the barriers that menstruation creates in their lives, especially from um, disadvantaged communities. Our company started officially in 2015, and we have been able to work in different communities across Tanzania and outside Tanzania. Since the inception of the uh, business, we were able to reach more than 100,000 young girls in different schools. We also provide education on menstrual hygiene management and sexual reproductive health. My experience at the Global Entrepreneurship Week in 2017 was amazing. I learned a lot from the program itself, but again, I was able to learn and network um, with fellow participants from different countries. 
everybody had an amazing project everybody was doing a uh, great impact in their societies and their communities that they were coming from i would like to say congratulations to all the participants in 2018 for the global entrepreneurship work thank you to untag but again i would like to say thank you to mr oliver ferrari and all other key stakeholders as i said our goal is simple to keep girls in school help them finish the education cycle which will open more opportunities um, to them a leopards caring about value a leopards keeping girls in school So thank you to Jennifer. It's also um, important to say that Jennifer will be the representative from the UN, uh, from UNCTAD at the UN TEDx event, which is being held here in the Palais in December, in early December. So if you can still get tickets, I recommend you register as soon as possible. So now we move to our scale-up candidates. And I would like to start by introducing Maria Teresita Oda. She is the founder of Tete Joyeria Pretapote. She is a migrant entrepreneur from Venezuela living in Switzerland. She makes jewelry from reclaimed and local materials and semi precious stones. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here. My name is Maria Teresita. I come from Venezuela, but I've been living in Switzerland for the past three years, so I'm a migrant myself and I'm the founder of Tete Jewelry. Malnutrition is now widespread. This is the reality of Venezuela now, and nearly 10% of the population has left in the search of a better future. For the majority of those who stay, it is hard to have hope. As a result, I felt that I needed to do something, and the resources I had were my passion for entrepreneurship and my deep desire to give back by creating beauty aimed at the chaos, as I believe that beauty has the potential to elevate and transform realities. And I wanted to do this by focusing on women. This is my story, and this is how Tete was born. Jewelry with a purpose. Our purpose is to contribute to women's advancement. And we want to do it by empowering our customer, empowering our team, and empowering our community. We empower our customer by delivering a handcrafted, gel delicate yet strong piece of jewelry with the capacity and the intention to imbue a sense of confidence, self-expression, inspiration, and beauty. And we do that by using recycled materials such as silver, brass, and we also use semi-precious stones and Sarovsky crystals. We also empower our team as is the case of Nazareth and Floriana, two young women who come from the outskirts of Caracas and from underprivileged families that they need to support. By working with Tete, they can benefit from a decent job, training, education and opportunities, and housing, so they can too have hope and achieve their dreams. We empower our community by financially supporting and partnering with the local NGOs working in Venezuela to offer assistance to women in need. 
In this sense, we support the, de the development sustainable goals of decent work, economic growth, and gender equality. For the past three years, we have found our niche in the market, both in Venezuela and online. But to be able to keep our operations and further reach our impact, we can do it alone. We need support. Our main goal by the end of 2019 is uh, to penetrate the Swiss market. Uh, and it's a market where the jewelry making uh, industry make up to 400 million years, uh, dollars a year. So this will allow us to produce and sell 1,000 pieces to keep supporting the youth, the local youth, and expand our team by hiring 10, uh, 10 local talents to support our activities in the jewelry making and the marketing activities, and to partner with at least two additional local NGOs and reach 100 women. Our revenue model is very simple and straightforward. We focus our efforts on the design, the production, and the sale of our pieces. As of today, we have sold 300 pieces, and we have confirmed the scalability of our project in Switzerland by participating in design markets and other events. And finally, our competitive advantage resides in our commitment of bettering the life of women in Venezuela, and also going beyond Venezuela by focusing on the direct and indirect beneficiaries of what we do. By winning this competition, we will have the chance to achieve our goals and also to help in the recovery of my country. Thank you very much. Well done, fantastic. Can I invite uh, the panel members or the audience or, and the audience to, to a question? Yeah. What type of jewelry do you make? <laughs> I think we have a buyer in the room. <laughs> Yes, thank you for your question. Um, we focus on creating all kinds of jewelry for women specifically, like earrings, the ones that I have, necklaces and uh, bracelets. And we try to make very simple but delicate designs um, with the intention that it doesn't uh, take too much of the real beauty of each woman. And what's your website so she can... <laughs> While she's sitting there, she can buy. Yes, the website is www.tetejewelry.com. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I'd like to invite uh, Enoch Nduimano. Enoch is the founder of the Association for Social Economic Development, I said. He's an entrepreneur from Burundi, living as a refugee in Uganda. He provides savings and credit services, financial and business literacy skills training to refugees and nationals. Welcome, Enoch. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Enoch Doimana. I am Burundian. I live in Uganda in a refugee camp. Arriving in Nakiva refugee settlement, I found refugees living like they are dying tomorrow because of struggling in the camp. Then that's why I came up with this ASED, but I started with small groups in the community, in different communities. When I succeeded, ASED came as a bigger one with its office. ASED is found in Nakivale Refugee Settlement, southwestern of Uganda, and it is uh, registered as a community-based organization. Uh, ASED is offering currently savings and loan uh, plus financial literacy and other services of ASED, the 
We need to train people about environmental uh, awareness, human rights, uh, health education. Uh, I said, uh, I said is addressing to a lack of uh, credit and uh, human uh, and uh, financial resources. Uh, also, those trainings of uh, environmental education uh, and health and uh, asset uh, services are contributing to a sustainable develop development goals, uh, goal one, no poverty, zero hunger, clean water and sanitation. Uh, how? Because when people are accessing loan to start their small businesses, they will be creating their business opportunities to fight against poverty. And uh, clean, uh, uh, clean, uh, clean water and hygiene and sanitation, uh, we have a plan of providing iron sheets in refugee camp uh, on credit, also providing them water tanks so that they can be harvesting clean water for their sanitation. Uh, as said, current active clients that are accessing savings and credit are 160 clients. And we have a plan of reaching uh, by 2021, 60,000 clients accessing credit and loan uh, and savings in the area where we are operating our uh, business. Also, this business or this, these services are much, much scalable because the area where you are operating it, there is a high population of around 90 uh, refugees without uh, nationals and other new arrival asylum seeker come day and by day and all they need those services. Uh, our revenue, as said the revenue, we earn the money from new members registration, a withdrawal charge on a ordinary savings account, on a loan application, loan administration, with a plus uh, interest on loan given out. And uh, we've increased the number of members, I said they will keep on uh, getting much money. Also, uh, I said has only one main competitor, and that, that competitor is offering only savings and credit. And for us, we are offering savings and credit with education, which is the only competitive uh, strategy found only in ASSED. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have, uh, we have a question from the floor? First of all, congratulations to what you have already achieved. Uh, I would be interested in what criteria you use to give credits to the people uh, in your community and to keep defaults rate low, obviously, and to have sustainability of your business model. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, first, before answering it, I would like to tell you that uh, in the business training, our members, we train them this topic which is called income, expenditure, saving, loan, and investment. We train them how to raise money uh, through doing small activities that they can make them get some small amount and in encourage them on the small uh, amount they get to, reduce, to, take, to deduct a sm other small amount to save, even if it is very small, it will grow in the future. Then, with their savings, we give them loan uh, according to the amount they have saved. Also, we request them to bring one guarantor to guarantee them 
uh, for the security of the loan. Because if I request you to bring a guarantor, you will bring someone you believe. You cannot be bring someone you don't believe. If you bring someone you believe, you will know that that one will not deceive you. If that one will not deceive you, you, you are, it means that you are making a set going on because we shall not lose our money. Thank you. Thank you. Superb. Thank you so much, Enoch. And now, uh, Tashi Lama. Tashi is the founder of Thank, Thank God It's Fairware. He's a migrant entrepreneur from Nepal living in Switzerland. Provides handwoven clothes and scarves from natural fabrics as well as handwoven carpets. Tashi, over to you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, it's winter, and I guess everybody has a scarf. But what if the scarf that you would wear will not just make you warm but, and beautiful, but also make a difference in the lives of women who made them? That was the reason why we started Thank God It's Fairwear, a fair fashion label based in Sangalan. My name is Tashi and I'm from Nepal. And for the last two and a half years, I've been living in Switzerland. I'm happily married to the co-founder, Carmen Lama. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's not Carmen. That's not her. <laughs> She's also from Switzerland. Uh, beside us, we have uh, three young Swiss designers from Zurich working for us and one country supervisor working in Nepal. Our products are unique and ethical. First and foremost, our main product, our scarf. Our scarves are hand woven, hand loom, and hand printed in Women's Foundation Nepal. We use wool, cashmere, and linen for the production, and our partner supports various projects related to women in different parts of the Nepal. Our clothes, our, clo our commitment to use natural fabrics like ham, organic cotton, and bamboo, yes, bamboo, has uh, helped us to create Classic cut and clear design. I'm sorry. Sorry. And our, third, and our third product, carpet, that we launched last year are very unique. Why? Because you can bring a picture you took during your holidays or some, some art you liked, and we will turn it into a carpet according to the size and color. Next. The SDGs goals that we are trying to solve is, the, for first and foremost, is SDG goal number five our inspiration, our reason, and our commitment to solve gender equality in Nepal. The, our partners who produce scarf for us are working in different uh, women-oriented projects like uh, giving legal assistance to women who need them and also pro providing microfinance to women who want to start their own business. We don't want to be one more NGOs in Nepal, but we want to give a sense of ownership to the women who work in our production house. We want, to make their, we want to give them employment so that they can make their own decisions, own choices, and make a difference in the society by themselves. And for sustainable goal number 11, sustainable cities and communities, we have learned so much in these three years that we want to co-partner with our production houses in Nepal to create a production house in the village called Gatlang in north of Nepal. Why we want to do it? Because we want to activate the local economy by using the local craftsmanship and resources. This will not just create a fair working place in the village, but also create, help the community in the long run. Thanks. Our customers. We have uh, women between 30s and 50s. I'm sorry if anybody are below it. Uh, who are very conscious, who love fashion, and conscious about what they buy and from who they buy from. And I'm very happy to be based in Switzerland so, so that everybody know that Swiss are the world champions in consuming fair trade and fair fashions. Uh, for, our, for our further expansion, we want to grow in uh, fair trade champions like Germany and UK as well. Next. Our revenue model is simple. First and foremost, we are selling directly through our online shop. Uh, if uh, you want to visit our website, you could see that. And next, we are going to many fairs that are oriented to fair fashions. And it has been very, very successful for us. And third, we are uh, available in 12 wholesale shops across Switzerland, including Zurich, Basel, and Bern. And fourth, we are available in three wholesale online platforms. Uh, and one of them is Morris. It's a big uh, online platform based in Zurich. And for our future revenue models, we want to work with corporate partners like Bank, where we 
will produce exclusively for them, for their clients. And for our four, uh, sixth, we want to work with interior designers to create more carpets because it's still a niche market. Next. Our, comp our competitions are young, fair fashion label like us and international brands like Armed Angels and People Tree. Uh, but we take them as our idols because there's so much to learn from them. But what sets us apart from them is our ability to bring the best out of both the culture, Switzerland and Nepal, be it in terms of management, production, or design. Our products are a celebration between Swiss contemporary designs and traditional Nepalese craftsmanship. Next. So, for if I win tonight, I'm going to bring this work to the village in Katlang and take my actions for SDG goal number 11. Because we learned this week that taking actions makes difference. So, uh, on that note, I would like to say that if you want to buy a beautiful scarf and make a change next time, then you know where to buy from. TGIFW. Thank you. Superb. Thank you, Tashi. Can I invite a question from Olivier? Two question. Uh, you'll sell on your own brand. Yeah. You won't work with company like Hermes or others. Uh, uh, excuse me. No, you, you will sell your product on your own brand. Yes. You won't work with company like Hermes or others. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, but when we... Uh, Hermes? Hermes, you guys know Hermes. Uh, it's a luxury company in France, you know, very well known company. Like um, Dior, yeah, so never heard. Okay, Gucci. doesn't matter. That's why we are based in Sangal. Sorry. Oh, okay, no <laughs> and other way, how many people how many people are working in Switzerland and how many people are working in Nepal? Right now in our core team it's me and my wife. And then we have three young Swiss designers. And in Nepal, we have one supervisor working for us who goes to our production houses in Women's Foundation Nepal. That's our scarf production. Then we have natural fabrics that produce our clothes. And carpet is my family business. So, And there, in our carpet production, we have 90 people. And in our Women's Foundation, we have 50 women working in each department of hand looming, hand weaving, and printing. OK. Yeah. Does that answer your question? And I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm sorry, in future, if you give me the network to work this with this luxury brand, then why not? That's why. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Tashi. And now to um, our next candidate, Gilbert Tarimo. Gilbert is the founder of Inogi Rabbits. He is from Tanzania, and it's a rabbit breeding farm that supplies local markets with hygienic, affordable rabbit meat. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gilbert Roman Tarimo. I am from Tanzania. I'm a director and founder of Inogi Rabbit Farm. Uh, apart from my business, I'm also a business consultant. This idea came out of frustration that I had with more other farmers, rabbit farmers, who could not fetch the 2,000 ton a month meat market from the neighbor country that is Kenya. Uh, thus, to my realizations, made me to feel like there is something I have to do here as an entrepreneur. Uh, I thought out that probably the small capitals to our farmers has made them not being able to reach the market, but also the volume. So I started my own small uh, rabbit farm. My products are rabbit meat, but um, I also uh, have byproducts such as um, rabbit urine, uh, rabbit manure, and rabbit skin. But I also uh, have extension services I offer from my farm to our rabbit network. Um, the United States Department of Agriculture and most literatures have uh, described rabbit meat to be with highest percent of meat protein, lowest levels of fast and, and cholesterol, and therefore it is being excellent choice for those uh, people watching their diets, such as those with heart diseases, uh, diabetes, and asthma. Um, my company, my project is uh, serving as a solution to sustainable development goals uh, of, poverty, uh, of, of, of zero uh, hunger and, and, and no poverty as 
I have a network of 600 farmers I work on who depend on us for markets and income. But also, uh, as I said, I have sub-products, which is rabbit skin and manure. Uh, it responds to uh, a responsible consumption and, 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 and productions as the rabbit uh, urine and manure act as a substitute to artificial fertilizers and pesticides that uh, uh, so we support organic productions to, to crop growers. Uh, I, my markets are tourist hotel restaurants and individual customers, and we have like influx of 200 million uh, tourists coming to our country, 50% of them coming from Europe, but we also have a population of 59 million Tanzanians that we serve and who are our target market. Um, we cover 60% of our revenue, uh, I mean, of our cost from the revenue developed out of 600 kilograms we sell uh, every month at $4 uh, dollars per kilogram. But we also have been able to collect uh, 900 from our network of farmers, us acting as a hub for their market. Uh, rabbit meat, as I've said, in Tanzania is still a niche market, and it does not face so much competition from itself or from our own farmers' network, but it faces a competition from its substitute, which is other substitute white meat, chicken and pork, but as I've said, it has a nutritional, nutritious comparative advantage over them. Uh, I have achieved identifying the local market for rabbit meat, but also as well as um, uh, 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 I've I've been able to form a network of 600 farmers I work on and who depend on me for markets. Uh, my next step is uh, to build awareness. And how am I going to do that? Uh, I've established if I win this prize, I'm going to first start a, meet, a first meat point, a meat store, rabbit meat store in Tanzania. But I'll also uh, uh, introduce barbecues in, book, in big and good performing bars in, in, in town, but also uh, the meat festival. This is a, as, as a means to you know, create awareness of the local uh, the rabbit, meat, rabbit market for, for, for our network of farmers. Um, but also, we have a network, we, as I've said, we have 600 network of farmers. I think in 12, uh, I mean, in two years, we'll be able to reach 200 farmers as there are other farmers who will be engaged as we go on with the business. But also, our goal is to, 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 to create a, a meat factory to be able to save uh, the two southern uh, current uh, market from Kenya, um, but also the 1.8 million ton of rabbit meat that is consumed annually, I mean, annually worldwide. Thank you, and I welcome for questions. So thank you, Gilbert. Do we have a question from the panel or the audience? I have a question. Hands up if you have tried rabbit meat. Okay. So your next uh, opportunity is to buy it from Gilbert. Gilbert, when are you moving to the operation to Europe? Um. I don't know what to answer you, but um, as I've said, uh, in five years, we're expecting um, as I've said, in five years, we are expecting to start a meat factory that uh, our target is being is a 2,000 current uh, demand from Kenya on a weekly basis. But, uh, you know, as I've said, we have 1.8 million tons is eaten annually, and most of 54% of it coming from Europe. So I think my next market is Europe in the next five years to come. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Khalid Hari, who is representing <laughs> the Hummus Town Cooperative, which is formed by um, Syrian refugees living in Rome in Italy, which sells fusion Syrian cuisine and artisanal crafts in Rome. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Happy birthday. Uh, so I'm Khaled Kari, I'm from Syria. I 
Unfortunately, I am a refugee. I am also a refugee. So I have been in Italy since 2017, and I have been involved with Homos Town from the day one. Being thank you so much. So being a refugee in Italy is very difficult. It's hard to find work. People are tired of seeing refugees because they have been so many arriving, which results in poor integration, and it's hard to make a living. Please. So, Humble Town is a business that makes and sells traditional Syrian food to Italian and international community. Our team is made up of Syrians from all over Syria. They come from different backgrounds and religions. Our team has five ladies that cook and nine men that help prepare, deliver, and service food. Please. Thank you. Since Homos Town was created a year and a half ago, we helped 13 immigrants, three zero. But there are one million Syrian refugees in Europe. We want to open more opportunities outside of Rome to go to another Italian cities and even here in Switzerland. So, we have a lot of work ahead of us. How are, we, how are we going to use the money if we win the grant? Today, we are a home operation. We need to become professional organization and we need a professional kitchen so that we can increase production and capacity. Thank you. So far, why is Homos Town so successful? The first reason is we are not charity. We teach refugees new skills. We give them opportunity to help, to help themselves, to help their families, and to contribute to their community. The second reason is of our, of our success is that our project contribute to one of most important goals, most important UN development goals, and, and it's and is to give protective employment and employment and peacent work for all. I get the last. <laughs> See? Again? Next slide. No, we don't have? No. Okay, this is the next slide. Okay. So, <laughs> no, no, I didn't finish. Before I thank you, before I thank you, before I thank you for this opportunity where I am right now, I want to briefly take about my story. When I came to Italy, I only spoke Arabic. Today, after being involved with Homos Town Project from a year and a half ago, I was given the opportunity to learn English and Italian. I built my network of new families and friends and supporters. I'm pre okay, I'm lucky. I'm lucky to have, <laughs> I'm lucky to have, I'm lucky, I'm lucky to have been given a full scholarship to John Cabot University. It's an American university in Rome. It's uh, the American University of Rome. It's uh, Homos Town has given me the pre, uh, platform to grow and achieve my potent. No, no, no. I, I, I have, I have to say it. I have said it correct. Potation. Potation. Yeah, this is. And thank you so much for for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you, Halid. Do we have uh, questions from the audience uh, uh, and panel members for Actually, Khaled? I'm ready for questions more than a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Claire? Can you choose a simple word? Yes, no, no, <laughs> I, I just want to know if you plan to, uh, to have your own uh, selling point, a, sh a shop, a food shop in, uh, in Rome. If I understand you well, yes. <laughs> yes, we are planning to have, like, to, to, like, to make our, our food, like, to uh, our product if in a market, in a market in Rome. Like, you can buy our food from the supermarket even if. We are planning for it, and we hope, like, we wish if we will arrive to this point. And okay, so, okay. Thank you so much for translate. <laughs> Okay, right now, actually, from one year and a half, we are working to have a specific place in Rome. And we have like a lot of people, supporters, to, have, to make this place, like to have a professional kitchen. Right now, we will reach our goal, inshallah, after two months, we will have professional kitchen to give more opportunity for another refugee. They are living in Rome, and even if in Milan, and this, and maybe we will arrive here, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, um, further questions at the end, uh, please uh, have a chat with Khalid at the end of the event. I'd next like to introduce Demetrio Santander from Ecuador. He's the co-founder and president of Huecana, which produces the brand Huecana Guayusa, which is an American, sorry, an Amazonian leaf beverage. They extract the benefits of the Wayusa leaf into beverages while creating employment for indigenous people. I'm afraid he's only distributing his goods to the panel members. Good afternoon, everybody. I said good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Clearly, the world needs energy. My name is Demetrio Santander. I am from Ecuador, and the name of my company is Huaycana. Next, please. So, I studied a master's degree in law and finance at the University of Oxford, but when I went back to Ecuador, I wanted to relive my childhood. I lived in the Amazon jungle, which are the lungs of the world. And I relieved the traditional ceremony of Wayusa, which is very mystical there. What I did there was really come to be, to be fully alive, finally. And then I realized this can be a business. So we started talking to a lot of experts in the food industry, and they told us we have to focus in flavor. Today, we have, it is my founder and myself, we have 20 people in our company, 20 employees, and we are working with 150 small-scale growers in the Amazon jungle. But what is the problem? Well, a lot of us, like right now, like in the morning, like after lunch, feel very tired. And what do we do? We drink coffee, energy drinks, or other stimulants. There are many problems with these stimulants because, for example, um, Energy drinks have a lot of sugar. They're not good for us. Or coffee or mate or other stimulants are not good for our stomach or can even stain our teeth. So what did we do? We created the first natural, uh, the first organic and healthy energy tea in the world. And why is this innovative, unique, and scalable? Because we have our own proprietary process. And of course, we register our brand. And we have been able with this, to uh, keep the properties of the leaf, which are what? Four times the antioxidants of green tea and two times the levels, uh, sorry, and the same level of caffeine as a natural coffee, as, a, as an instant coffee. So, what stage are we in? Can you please pass it next? Yeah. So, what stage are we in? Three years in, we have 14 products, and our key suppliers are the Amazon growers. Yes. The Amazon growers, we are attacking, we're, sorry, we are tackling SDG number one. Uh, how are we doing that? We are paying them from 25 up to 50% more than fair trade prices. Um, we have difference in pricing because for bigger volumes, we have to pay, we have to negotiate with them. 
and we are generating an average of $370 per grower per month. This is a very, very measurable impact uh, measure that we have. And of course, why is this important? Because currently these growers are working with coffee or cacao, and these products are commodities that are very volatile, and many of them were really losing a lot of money uh, during all these years. Also, we are uh, uh, working on uh, SDG number 15. How are we doing this? It is a requirement for the growers to work with an agroforestry, tradition, agroforestry traditional system, which is called chakra. They already had the system. It is a requirement for us to work with us to keep this. Right now, we are protecting 42 hectares of wild species in the Amazon, and we expect to protect 1,000 more by 2023. So, what is the market opportunity? Well, we have very big clients uh, currently. They are with their first orders, but some of them are there. And as you can tell, for example, Hain Celestial, um, Twinings or BI Nutraceuticals, these are companies that are interested in these new ingredients. And currently, we have uh, also now the opportunity to enter Europe because the regulation has opened for Wayusa, for this product. So, our business model, our business model has three types of, uh, three types of, okay, I have to run. So, we have ingredient products, branded products, and also we have uh, uh, partnerships with several several extra companies. So, this year we will, we will have revenue close to half a million dollars. We are working, like I said, with 150 small growers, and one of the key achievements we have is that last year we won the World Tea Championship with a bronze medal with the only Wayusa that won a medal. So, what are the future milestones? The next year we want to sell one million growers so that in the next 24 months we can work, uh, dollars, so we can work in the next 24 months with 500 growers and protect 300 uh, hectares. What are we going to do with the money if we win today? We are going to create the first association for Wayusa growers in the world so that we can actually work with these growers in the long term with sustainability. Today, it will be Ecuador and tomorrow it will be all the Amazon jungle that we are saving. The Amazon jungle, the lungs of the world, the future of the humanity. Thank you very much. We have a question from the floor for Demetrio. Thank you. Uh, are you willing to share your model with uh, other communities uh, within the uh, Amazon? Thank you so much for that question. It was such an important part that I couldn't cover right now. But there are two paradigms that our company is changing. One is that we are not working with thousands of growers and marketing. We are working with thousands of growers right now. Right now we are working with hundreds of growers, but we are generating impactful, impactful income in each one of them. In the future we will be able to work with thousands, of course, if we keep growing the demand for the product. Now moving on to changing the paradigm of working on monocultives. Monocultives is what is killing the Amazon, for example, in addition to other economic activities, but what we require, like we were telling you, is the agroforestry, agroforestry chakra system that uh, the indigenous uh, Amazon growers already use. We require that for them to work with us. And what we really want to do with the association we are going to create is share the knowledge. Share this knowledge with the rest of the growers that are younger or that are just starting their own farms, so that all the industry shaped around Guayusa is going to be in the future within this chakra agroforestry system. What does this mean? That if the demand keeps growing as it is growing right now, there is a bright future for the product and it is going to be 100% sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitri. And now I'd like to invite Ruby Al, who is um, the founder of um, Digital Learning Systems Lumen Labs in Kenya, based in Nairobi. Um, it's a project-based learning system that develops digital skills and critical thinking. What is one thing you could do today to make your community a better place? 
Most of us take it for granted that we can come up with an answer just like that, but how did you actually do that? How did you come up with an idea? This is something that students in Kenya struggle to do. My name is Ruby, and three years ago, I moved to Kenya to found Lumen Labs, an organization that helps students build problem-solving skills to answer such questions through project-based computer education. What that means is we teach students to use computers in the context of solving a real problem. We design computer education curriculum that focuses on specific challenges for students to solve, say, coming up with a business idea. Second, we've built a mobile SMS survey platform that allows us to transform a phone, any phone, with texting capability into a tool for data collection. Now, students go around, they use phones, survey and collect data from community members to learn about the problem they face. That data goes to an Android application where it's aggregated into anonymous class data sets for teachers to use and guide students through project learning on computers. So, for example, students or uh, teachers actually will say, write a word research report, or analyze the data on Excel, or pitch me a solution using PowerPoint. And finally, that data goes to our own web-based portal, where we have the ability to clean it, analyze it, provide it back to an organization to help them measure their impact. Everything here, from curriculum to mobile platform to web-based portal, we've built from scratch, we own the IP. At the heart of this idea is SDG4, quality education. Education in Kenya is typically based on rote learning. I tell you A, you spit A back at me. But what this actually does is perpetuate dependency syndromes and lack of independent thinking ability. Computer education is essential if we want our students to have 21st century skills. But it's also only effective if we have the ability to realize, to imagine the things that we can actually do with it. It's not just about mastery of skills, it's actually about creating a smarter thinker. Our target customers are youth stakeholder organizations working with secondary age students in Kenya, constituting almost 10,000 schools. Now, many of these organizations want to provide computer training to their students, but have neither the time nor the expertise to do anything beyond dump a few computers in a lab, hope they get used. We know that without a complementary education curriculum solution in place, they don't. That's where we come in, offering our services to tap into a growing $99 million market in Kenya alone. In the long term, we plan to offer an open source version of the curriculum, scale mobile data collection, and tap into a niche segment of a $45 billion market research industry. Typically, we see three types, three types of customers. We see those who want an out-of-the-box curriculum solution, simple. We see those who require custom curriculum for a specific issue that they want their students to engage with. And then we see those who want customized curriculum as well as the mobile data that it generates. So we've designed three programming and pricing tiers to match each of these three needs, with each tier accounting for a sales margin of at least 50% to achieve profitability in six years. And finally, looking at the computer education landscape in, uh, in Kenya, what we see are organizations that focus on skills training only without a project-based approach. We see organizations that focus on students only, without additional training or capacity building for teachers. And we see organizations that focus on a direct-to-user intervention that may be wonderful, but is impossible to scale. We are the only company to offer an affordable, scalable, turnkey solution for other organizations, a computer education blueprint, if you will. We are the only company to combine digital data collection with computer literacy, creating a unique value proposition that nobody else has. Three years ago, I asked myself, how do you create a replicable, a sustainable, and a holistic model for computer education to serve the world's poorest? While I'm standing in front of you today pitching one answer to this question, my hope is that two, three years from now, it's Lumen students standing here pitching even better solutions because we've equipped them with tools to be change makers in their own communities. Thank you, and I can take any questions from here. So I invite a question from the number of students in the room. Would you like to use 
the platform. Hands up from the students in the room. We do have a question from the floor. <laughs> you can still ask a question, it's fine. I was wondering, first of all, congratulations, it's an amazing uh, project. I was wondering, as you said, you, you'd like to help a lot of like, the poorest people or poor students, um, but your price is pretty expensive, so is there anything in place to help those students afford those curriculums or those courses you're offering? So what we learned the hard way is that if we want to provide computer education in a way that scales, we can't do it B2C. We can't do it direct to the user. In Kenya, for example, computer education is not a part of the mandatory curriculum. And we have communities struggling to pay their mandatory school fees. So it's impossible for me to go to a mother and say, look, I know you can't pay for your mandatory school fees, but why don't you pay for this extracurricular computer education instead? It's not feasible. And so what we realized early on is if we're going to create a business model that works, we have to create a business model that is actually generating value for somebody outside of the user. So that's why we sell B2B, first of all. And second of all, that's where the data component of our business comes in. If we're able to make a sustainable revenue stream out of data, what I mentioned briefly is we want to um, offer an open source version of the curriculum, something that anybody can access at no cost. It allows us to scale our mobile data faster. It allows us to push direct to user interventions without actually compromising the sustainability of the business itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruby. So can we have one last round of applause for all of our entrepreneurs, all 12 of them who have worked so hard this week and have the, displayed all sorts of entrepreneurial competencies to stand up and pitch to you. So one last round of applause, please. So now I invite the expert panel to pick up their various uh, gifts and uh, drinks and uh, take them with you and go with Fulvia to finalize your deliberations, please. For our audience, if you remain in your seats, but get out your mobile phones, we're going to try and get you voting on some key questions. So if you just bear with us for a few moments while we change the slide deck up, that would be great. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to take your seats again as we welcome back our panel members, which means that we're ready to announce the award winners today. I invite you to, to sit. Okay. To our 12 young entrepreneurs, we would like to congratulate all of you and commend you for your hard work and determination. You're an inspiration to us all. It's been an honor to work with you this week. Today is a celebration of your entrepreneur entrepreneurial journey so far, showcasing not only your enterprise, but also your persistence and your appetite and your determination to lead social change. I'd like to invite Olivier Couto, Delegate for International Geneva and representative from the state of Geneva, to announce the winners. Firstly, to announce the winner of the startup, and then we'll do the winner of the scale-up. And Olivier Ferrari will present the prize. So, Olivier Couto. All right. Okay, don't worry, I won't be long. I'm sure that you are much more interested in what is in this envelope than the speech I'm going to deliver now. Um, just wanted to say that uh, I think that events like today are important events because they do contribute to reinforce the link between uh, Geneva and the rest of the world. And I'm especially thinking about the uh, entrepreneurs who came here to uh, present their uh, project to, uh, to Geneva, to the United Nations here in Geneva. This link, this connection between Geneva and the rest of the world is just uh, crucial, I would say. Uh, if Geneva and the international organizations based here uh, are not aware uh, of what is the uh, situation 
uh, in the field uh, if they are not connected with the needs, the difficulties, the problems, the ideas, the resources, requests, and hopes of the rest of the world, I think that uh, there is a serious problem for Geneva. All the uh, discussions which are taking place in this building, all the uh, negotiations uh, about the resolutions which are adopted in, in, at the United Nations, all the uh, reports uh, that are adopted, all the uh, programs uh, that are launched uh, will be meaningless if there is not this connection because there will be no connection. It will be disconnected with uh, the reality. Sometimes I say to myself that uh, uh, Geneva maybe is too comfortable in the sense that uh, uh, we live in a safe uh, and wealthy city. Uh, we uh, have probably the, the working condition among the best in the world. We have a beauty, beautiful view on the Mont Blanc. Uh, and uh, in this condition, it might be difficult to uh, stay connected with the realities of the world, stay connected with uh, the wars, with the diseases, with the uh, development challenges, uh, which are at the core of the international organization's mission. So um, this connection definitely is extremely important, and, uh, um, but I'd like to remind that uh, at the very origin of uh, International Geneva, there is already this connection between the field and Geneva. I'm thinking here about the Red Cross, about the founder of the Red Cross, Henri Dunant, who went to the field, to, who went to Italy actually, to Solferino, who was, a, who was a witness of the aftermath of the battle there. He came back to Geneva and he was credible because he was there, because he was in the field. And uh, that's how he managed to convince the people to uh, launch quite sustainable projects. I'm thinking about the Red Cross and the international humanitarian law. So thank you very much uh, to the United Nations, uh, to the to UNCTAD, to the other organizations involved in this uh, event, to the sponsors, uh, because you did contribute to reinforce this link between Geneva and the rest of the world. So now to the important moments we are all waiting for, the results, the winners. I start with the startup. Uh, that's correct. And the winner in the uh, startup category is Help Mom Adereni Abudun in Nigeria. So before announcing the winner in the scale-up category, I, I just let the floor to Olivier Ferry who has a, a word to say. Thank you. Hello. Just the main point, I said before, you are all a winner. We have to choose, we have to choose someone. But the deal is this one. The price that you will receive is to be shareholder of your company. All the sevens who were pitching before are agree with that or not. If one of you disagree, no problem, but... Okay, so I give you the floor, please. So the winner in the scale-up category is... Demetrio Santander, Waikana, Guyana, Ecuador.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on this special occasion to celebrate young entrepreneurs from all around the world taking action through enterprises to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. We have one last task before more photographs. One last task, which is to invite James Zahn, the Director of the Investment and Enterprise Division of UNCTAD, to conclude our celebration of entrepreneurship today with some closing remarks. James. Thank you very much. What a great moment. It was the same time last year, in the same place, we had a similar event, and again, Thank you very much for coming and uh, thank to Mr. Ferrari in supporting of this. Thank you to the panelists. I recognize the half of you were here last year and this is our joint endeavor and we continued. And th today it shows another success. And also to our partners uh, and the organizations uh, joining us for this important event. I think the significance of this event goes well beyond the ceremony of today. Look at the process we have gone through. And we have, I just learned from Fulvia that's over, 100, over 200 candidates participated. The important thing is that you are, de you are demonstrating to the world that there's something that we can do and we can do together for the goods, for achieving the SDGs. Money is a problem. Money is not a problem. There's a lack of financing, and there's not a lack of financing at the same time. Why do I say that? If we look at the demand or the, the funds we need for achieving SDGs, UNCTAD has a calculation that is used widely by leaders um, in, the, in the world. That is 2.5 trillion US dollars annually as a gap for financing of the SDGs. We need 3.9 trillion US dollars annually, and for the time being, we still have the gap of 2.5 trillion annually. That is the problem, that is the financing aspect. But in the meantime, it's not a problem. Three weeks ago, in this building, in the whole UN, um, in the Palais de Nation, we had 6,600 investment development stakeholders. We had managers of pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, private equity funds, family businesses, impact investors. We had stock exchange executives. We have the ministers, heads of states. And we have so many of stakeholders here. They're all willing to support SDGs. They're all willing to chip in. And the questions I often got when I met with the impact investors and, 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 and pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, they said, we are willing to allocate a percentage of our funds to finance SDG projects. But the question is, where are the SDG projects? The SDG projects, bankable um, pipeline, they will be created by you you are here, and you are everywhere in the world. But that connection is not made. That's why we have this platform. That's why we have you, luckily, as the role model for the rest of the young entrepreneurs in the world to make it happen, to generate more and more bankable pipeline SDG projects. And you have proved to be successful in doing that. And three weeks ago, we had a youth forum in parallel with our World Investment Forum 2018. And we had 200 young entrepreneurs just try to do the same as you have been doing and that as you are doing here. So this is what we need to do together. And the role of UNCTAD and our sister organizations, ILO or IO, uh, IOM and UNHCR and uh, WIPO, 
We try to pl provide a platform. We try to provide a linkage. We try to link you to give you the opportunities to make sure that abundant resources that are ready to fly, to flow into the SDG sectors on the ground in your countries, in your city, and your villages will be there. So it is a tremendous task for all of us to mobilize the resources, to channel them into the SDG sectors on the ground to ensure they make the impact as you try to demonstrate it through your project, through your pitching, seeing that in the years that you will get it. I congratulate those who have won the prize, but I also congratulate those who haven't. You also gained. You gained the lessons, you gained the experience, and that's most valuable. Just to let you know the example of our special advisor to UNCTAD on SMEs and entrepreneurs, Mr. Jack Ma. He, he's, our, he's our special advisor, and jointly we establish a program called Training of Young Entrepreneurs. At the moment, at the moment, there are 50 young entrepreneurs selected jointly by UNCTAD and the Jack Ma's Foundation. They are now in Hangzhou having the training of how to run the business, how to scale up the business. We are doing that, so we work together. I just want to use this example. He said in his early days, he tried to find a job in McDonald's. Twelve were interviewed, and eight were accepted. He was among the four that was not accepted. He tried to apply for a job for a local police station to be a police officer, and there was among the seven, and the six were recruited, he was the seventh. So don't be discouraged. I think there's plenty of opportunities. We are all talented. Tomorrow will be yours. You will be successful. Thank you very much for all the participants here. So thank you, James. That concludes our celebration for today. Uh, I invite everyone to the stage to take photographs with the candidates. Thank you and good night.